Hello, I'm Yubri from Smallfish. Welcome to Fish School 2.0 Episode 1. Today is gonna be a long episode because we'll be making our character controller, which also includes the animations and the camera control. Before we start, I'd like to shout out Carson, who has also made a tutorial on player controller. I'll leave the video in the description if you wanna check it out. Obviously, our code and methods are going to vary, but that's what I love about the scene system. There's hundreds of different ways to make the same thing, which depends on the game you are making and the person behind it. To sum it up, no, my code is not bad. Stop it. Let's start this episode with some theory. As a programmer, one of the best skills you're going to use is problem solving. In this case, we need to break down what a player is supposed to be in our game, which mechanics can be their own components and which ones need to be shared with other types. Let's go through every feature and figure out which ones need to be specific to the player. First, we need our player to have a model. That's easy, we already have a component for that. It's the model renderer. Now, we need a controller to handle the movements. Sandbox already provided us a default one to use, which is gonna be enough for us today, but in the future, we'll have to create our own. This needs to be hooked up to something that handles the input though. Then, we want our player to have animations. And since we are using Sandbox's citizen model, it already comes with a component to handle the animations for us. We just need to hook it up to something that manages the logic. Lastly, we need a camera, which as you already know is there by default. All we need is something to actually have it follow the player. As you can see, our player is mostly composed by components that are already available to us. All we have to do is hook it all up with a single component that is going to handle the inputs and the logic. For example, inside of this main component, we check for the player's inputs, they press spacebar, and from here, we tell the controller to launch the player upwards, the animator to play the jumping animation, which tells the model renderer to actually move the bones, and then we tell the camera to update its position. But now, we have to think bigger, we have to think of the whole project, we're gonna have enemies, do we need to accommodate for this? We would if we wanted to have a mechanic that takes control of them, but we are not making Super Mario Odyssey by Shadowbrain. What we do have though, is a health and damage system. Everything from the player, to this knot, the NPCs, and even structures, is going to need health. All of that can be unified in a component that is going to be assigned to anything that has health. If we want to damage them, we check if they possess this component. If it does, then we use the built-in method to remove health and eventually kill the receiver. Why can't we have just this health logic inside of our main player component, you may ask? Well, if each component had their own health property built-in, then when we want to deal damage, we would need to check for every possible component that does have it. It's either that, or it's C-sharp reflection. Don't worry though, if you want to use a common component for health, but need to attach logic to it, like maybe exploding on death, then we can use C-sharp delegates, which we'll look into in a future episode. Right, we got the theory down. Now, let's get to practice. Let's start by creating a new game object and renaming it to player. We said we needed a model, so let's add a model renderer component. What we want here though, is the skinned model renderer, which allows the model to have bones, tas, animations. If we wanted to display a static model, like a crate, tree or table, we'd use a normal model renderer. For anything that contains bones, like ragdolls, players or cars, we'd use the skinned model renderer, named after the fact that the vertices in the model are skinned to the bones, allowing them to deform the mesh by moving the bones around, like what an animation does. For our model, let's select the default citizen model. You can find it in the citizen folder, then navigate to the models folder, again there's a citizen folder, and now select the citizen model. If you are not seeing this exact view, then you might have to toggle these buttons here. Let's take a look at our beautiful player inside of play mode. Holy carp! Freddy 5 bear! Or, 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 or! We forgot to remove the post processing on our camera. Right click the components and select remove. Go back to our player and let's add the character controller provided to us by Sandbox. 
If you don't find this component, then it means it has been removed, and I've been lied by Gary, who promised that no components were getting removed or replaced. The component itself isn't going to do anything, it's only here for us to access and handle the annoying math problems involved in making the player move throughout the terrain. It's getting crowded in here, collapse the components through the little arrows. This way it's going to be easier to navigate. Another thing we said we would need is animations. Since we are using the citizen model, we also have an animation helper at our disposal. Look up citizen animation helper. As you can see, it has a property called target, which is where it's going to apply all the animations to. It says it takes in a skinned model renderer. To add a reference to our renderer component, we just click and drag it into the box. If you try to click and drag a component that doesn't match, it will remain grey. But if you do it with the right one, it lights up and accepts it. Let's save, never hurts to spam Ctrl S every once in a while. For our camera, here's what we're gonna do. A camera component by itself cannot contain the position and rotation of the camera. It relies on the game object it's been placed on. Like we mentioned in the zeroth episode, the camera here is a game object, with the camera component added on top of it. But if we were to just add a camera component to our player, it would render the world at its feet. So what we're gonna do is have the player game object do their own thing and hold all the logic. And then we're gonna take this camera game object and drag it into the player. This way the player is composed by two game objects, the camera game object being a child to the main player one. Alternatively, you could right click the player, create an empty object on it and then add the camera component, but this camera was already conveniently provided to us. If you noticed, while we were dragging the camera into the player, the camera's local position changed. That's because, while staying in the same world space, the coordinates were translated from being relative to the scene to being relative to the player. In fact, if we try moving the player, you can see that it's also moving the camera, same way when rotating it. Let's just position the camera the way we want it to look in-game, using the help of this window. Finally, let's go back to our player and add a new component, but this time we are going to select the option to create a new component. Give it a name, I'll go with Snot Player, and now it gives us the option to use one of the pre-made components to build off of. For now, it's just two, a Shrimple component and a UI component. Maybe they are going to add more in the future. Let's just go with the Shrimple component. We'll look at the other in a future episode. Pick where you wanna save it. I'll just make a new folder called Components. And save. Well, that's not what we wanna hear. Looks like I made an error. I put a spacebar in between our component name, and now it's going to screw up with the whole formatting. When this happens, you are going to see an error pop up. If you want to investigate further, you can look at the console window and select the error. But we already know the problem. The problem being that our component has a space in between the name. And that is not allowed in C sharp. So let's just delete the file and retry. This time without a space in between. Sorry, I forgot to zoom into the editor, I will be doing that next episode. If you have Visual Studio or Visual Studio Code, it's going to open the file with them. If you don't have those, then I suggest checking the wiki page about code editors in Sandbox and how to select your preferred one. Let's look at the default component. It only uses the Sandbox namespace, but here's something that I like to do on every project. I make a new c -sharp file and call it Globals. Inside of it, I just add global namespaces that I want to be included everywhere in my project. This way, I don't have to remember to add them every time. For now, I'll just have global using system and global using sandbox. As the project gets bigger, you'll find yourself adding more to this list. Let's go back to our component and see the rest. Close this old one, it's probably broken at this point. By default your components are a sealed class, inheriting from the base component class. Do not get fooled by this sealed keyword, 
you can just remove it, it's not going to break anything or get you funny looks by other programmers. The default box collider inherits the collider component, so Facepants has no problem inheriting components themselves. We have no reason to do that though, so let's keep it as it is. Now, let's see what we are given to work with inside of components. We have these methods to override and add logic to. We've got on update, you can see it here, this runs every single frame. Then we've got on fixed update, which is called every tick instead of every frame. Meaning that if you want to have something important that needs to be persistent, you can have it set to run 20, 30, 60 times a second. You can pick that number by selecting the scene itself in the hierarchy. Here it is, fixed update frequency. So if we put anything here, it's going to run 50 times a second. Even if your game is running at 2 frames per second, this logic is going to run 50 times a second. Our player movement code is going to go here. We don't want it to be tied to our frame rate, as if we were with the on update instead. Among the other important methods, we have on start which gets called when the component is first enabled. On enable, which is called when the component is enabled and after on start, there is also on disabled. You can disable components through code to stop it from running any of the codes without deleting it, or you can also do it in the editor, through the checkboxes here. There is also a way to run components inside of the editor, but we are not going to see it in this series. Lastly, among the ones we're going to see, we have on destroy, which is when the component gets removed or deleted. There are other methods that we're not gonna cover, you can read up on them through the docs. As I was saying, we're gonna use on fixed update to handle our movement logic, but let's not remove the others just yet, they might be useful. Let's start by setting our properties. Like I mentioned early, this is going to manage the logic for the animator, camera and controller. So let's add properties for all of these. Use the property attributes to have these appear inside of the editor. I also include getters and setters in every property. I don't think you have to anymore, but I'm used to doing this. We can modify them if we want, but we're not covering that. As you can see, we used the game object type for the camera instead of the camera component. That's just because the camera follows the game object it's on. Remember? Let's also add a reference to the character controller and one for the Citizen Animation Helper. As you can see, Visual Studio already added the reference to Sandbox.Citizen for me. If your program doesn't do that, make sure not to forget it. While we're at it, let's also put properties for player variables, like walk speed, run speed and jump strength. These ones are just floats as you can see. Save your code and wait for that satisfying, successful compile sound. Let's check out our component. For now it doesn't update automatically, so just switch to something else and switch back to the component. You'll see that our properties have appeared. Just like a puzzle, we now need to fit the pieces needed. Drag the controller in. Drag the animation helper in. And lastly for the camera, we go to the hierarchy, expand our player, who has the camera game object parented to it, and drag the camera from the hierarchy to the inspector into the property. We can mess around with these values by either sliding here, or typing directly. A fun little thing you can do is math operations inside as well. If we want our run speed to be twice our walk speed, let's type 120 times 2 and it will return 240. Let's see if it knows spam does. Yep, it does. Set it back to 250, I like it that way. Now let's spice these properties up. Go into your editor and give a description to each of these properties. If you type three forward slashes, most editors will autocomplete and give you a summary for the property, which then the compiler fetches and displays in the inspector. Let's do the same on all three of them. Now let's add sliders to make it more intuitive. After the property attribute, we're gonna add the range attribute. Display a slider which goes from 0 to 400 and is in increments of 1. 
If we set the increments to 0.1, you'll be able to fine tune it better. Add the sliders to the others. For the jump, let's do 10 increments at a time. Save and check the inspector. As you can see, the jump is set by 10 units at a time, while the others were one at a time. I'm sorry we haven't got to actual coding in this episode, but it's getting too long already, so we're gonna end for today. See you in the next episode, where we actually do what I said we would. Thanks for enjoying our fish tent.